I'd like to uh, <coughs> recognize uh, Craig and uh, Cindy Corey, the parents of Rachel Corey, who gave her life um, standing in front of the bulldozers as they were bulldozing uh, the, the homes in Palestine. Moment of silence, please. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize in the audience a representative from the Malaysian Peace Organization to Criminalize War, who was present at Sabra and Shatila, Dr. Ang Sui Shai. In this section, we are going to discuss the idea of sociocide. And I believe this is particularly important as we watch what is happening in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, the Sudans, and are called to remember that there are seven countries to be occupied by US forces in five years, according to General Wesley Clark. And this new type of warfare that's being waged that is absolutely total, I've called it patricide because with the use of these weapons, the land even itself is uninhabitable and is doing harm to the people. We have um, Johan Galtung who will make our first presentation on what is sociocide. So I would like for him to come forward as he is doing now. Thank you. Honorable members of the jury, so my task is to try to define a concept I introduced in the mid-80s, sociocide. And my contention is that it is a concept at the same level as a genocide, the massive killing of a category of people just because they are members of that category, and ecocide, the killing of nature. What we mean by killing in genocide and ecocide is to get rid of their ability to reproduce themselves. And for that reason, when you are looking at genocide, the killing of women is often the most important part. When you look at ecocide, the killing of diversity and symbiosis of nature may be the most important part. The killing of a society is the killing of a social system's ability to reproduce itself. So here we are in sociology, and with your permission, honorable jurors, I'll just bring you into a little expedition analytically in terms of definitions. But let me preface it by saying, I know perfectly well that sociocide is not an object of positive international law. I can sense one reason why. This is what Western colonialism is about. It was also about killing. It was also about destroying nature but it was above all tearing apart, fragmenting, marginalizing local indigenous societies. There are people in the room who will talk after me, much more knowledgeable about what happened on this continent. But I'm just saying that an international law, which to a large extent is an Anglo-American institution, 
run by international law professors from five universities, I'm not mentioning the names, that they are not very friendly to that concept is to be expected. However, among these prefatory remarks, let me add, there are other ways than the legal ones of condemning what is happening, moral, political, and other ways. I'll come to that. Let's now move into definition. Let's first take note that human beings have the capacity of self-reproduction. But in order for us to be not only biologically reproducing ourselves, we need four things, four basic needs. And about this catalog, there is much discussion among us who are working on it. So here is my catalog, survival. Wellness, freedom and identity. Freedom means having options. Identity means having a reason for living. Now the task of a society, the four tasks of a society, are the basic social prerequisites. And they are just the same. The first one is security. To provide security for its members. The second one is sustainability. <coughs> to provide the economic sustenance for its members. To be able to produce the necessities for the basic needs. And maybe the, the normalities on top of that and a nice little couple of luxuries once in a while. The third one is identity. <coughs> it is cultural. It is the society as a carrier of an identity. And the fourth one is autonomy, to be master in one's own house. This, not, not, this does not presuppose a territorial country could just as well be a nomadic tribe more than 10,000 years ago that satisfies these four characteristics. But you find these four prerequisites everywhere. With some hesitation, you can also include a monastery. Now, a monastery, in principle, has only one gender, although evil tongue says that nunneries and monasteries have a tendency to have tunnels connecting them you would expect. And in that setting, monasteries are among the most long surviving societies in the world. Even if their biological reproduction is done by recruitment rather than sexually. Now, having said that, modern societies add two concepts, nation and state. The nation is the carrier of identity. I'm coming to it immediately. The state is the overarching administrative nexus of all of this. The administrator of all of the above. All of the above meaning exactly security, sustainability, identity, autonomy. The nation, I think, has four characteristics. It's not quite the same as the list I've given. One is idiom, language. One is worldview as a broader concept than religion. And one is history and one is geography. Now that's quite a lot. History means the past. And those who do not belong to the nation may say it's mainly myths. Okay, mainly myths. It means the present, the interpretation of the present. And it means the future. The history of the future is an increasingly important part of history. And even positivistically trained historians are gradually coming to it. And the last one is a geographical attachment. Space. Space, not in the sense of economic sustenance, but in the sense that these hills are ours. This is where our ancestors were buried. This is where our history was enacted. 
I repeat now, we have a lot of characteristics. And of course the question is Israel, Palestine. There are many people in this room who are more knowledgeable about this, so I'll just indicate some basic key points. And as a matter of fact, I'll not fill entirely my quota of time, because basically my point has been made. I've defined social side. I have taken as point of departure society as a social system with a capacity for self-reproduction. Don't confuse it with a country. The country may not be able to live up to that, and it may also have many societies inside, and the society may actually comprise more than one country. European Union is to some extent becoming a society, and to some extent not. All of this can be discussed, debated, but the social prerequisites are there. Again, to take the forward, security, sustenance, Identity and autonomy to be master in your own house. And the modern version, the nation as the carrier of identity and the state as the principal responsible for autonomy. And the nation then being the carrier of quite a lot. Idiom, worldview, time and space. Now, these are basic categories, and as a matter of fact, you may say that what happens in the world today is the decline of the state, and what is rising is the nation. And maybe many nations find more ability to survive within a macro nation called a civilization. If that civilization is finding a macro state called a region. But let's leave that aside for the time being. And let us now come to Israel. Israel is a part of Western colonialism. It is settler colonialism with one exception. And the exception is important. It belongs to the myth of the past. And the myth has some basis. We were there before. I'm willing to accept the part of that. And for that reason, I stand here also as a defender of an Israeli society and its right to exist, to survive and not to be exposed to sociocide, including socio-suicide, which is also something that some might engage in. <coughs> now, having said that, on what do I base that? Well, <laughs> we'll not go into the details of it. I'll only say that myths are important. Myths are social realities. And for that reason, a state with Jewish characteristics, I embrace. And I have been defending it repeatedly since 1964 in Arab countries. I've done that, and I can assure you, with no bribe or payment from the Israeli foreign ministry that doesn't like me at all. But that has to do with something else, and that's something else I'd like to mention immediately. One way you're getting anti-Semitism certificates is to propose a solution. They don't like solutions, because solutions might put some limitations on expansion, because they might even risk that some people find the solution quite reasonable. Volker Bernadotte was murdered by the Stern gang on that basis, and his murder was authorized by a person who later became Israel Prime Minister, Yitzhak Shabit. Now having said that, we have a pattern where you then can go step by step. And you can start with security. There is a total denial of the Palestinian right to organize its own security. The security is permitted to organize is for the security of Israeli settlers and not for the security of Palestinians. You could argue that in a future arrangement, <coughs> it could be an organization for joint settlement. So for instance, I myself am arguing in favor 
not of a one-state solution, not of a two-state solution, but of a six-state solution. The community of Israel with the five Arab neighbors, Syria, Lebanon, excuse me, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, fully recognized according to international law, Egypt, and Israel. Within that setting, a joint security arrangement might make sense. But this is not what the Israelis are according to the Palestinians. Sustenance. For sustenance, you need land. The land deprived from the Nakba onwards is remarkable. And the pushing of the Palestinians into marginal territories where not only land is missing, but as Noam Chomsky pointed out, in the so-called Area C, water is missing. And you can look at the water division between the settlers and the Palestinians. It is shocking. In other words, the most elementary parts of sustainability is something that they are deprived of. Now, how about the next one, identity? that opens for nation. I'm not going to argue that Israel is depriving them of Arabic as a language, nor am I going to argue that they're being deprived of the particular combination of Islam, Christianity, and secularism that I associate with Palestinians, including the very, very numerous Palestinian friends I have. I'm not going to argue that. But I'm going to argue that they're depriving Palestinians of time and space. Sacred space. I'm now, now thinking of agricultural land. I'm thinking of sacred space. And I see time as maybe the most important one. The proposal to forbid any mention of Nakba in other words, to cleanse the past of the traumas and the glories. That is to deprive people of their identity at the very basic point. To harass them constantly in all kinds of possible and impossible ways is to deprive them of the present. But on top of this comes depriving them of the future. Why? How? By Israel never telling the world what they mean by recognized and secure borders. Doesn't look like the Jordan River to me. Somebody got famous for actually baptizing a person who was standing there. It's not the ideal river for geopolitical reasons. As a matter of fact, rivers are quite, not quite unimportant. We all know the Israeli flag, designed between the start of David, between two baby lines that look like rivers. And that brings, of course, up to us the vision of whether the Israeli gold still is the one that was in the Stern Charter from Nile to the Euphrates. And Rifkin's vision was a vision of an Israel from Nile to the Euphrates with no Jews and the third temple. So it's a period of intense terrorism on the Israeli side. And I think one of the strongest letters I have seen denouncing it was signed Albert Einstein. Now, having said that, when you leave the future unspecified, you make it impossible for those whose society you are killing to plan. Planning for what? What is it? What is their next step? Our experience is that they are as afraid of peace and as the board. And for that reason, whenever you have an accord, and the accord is somehow one way or the other corrupted in one direction or the other, and I'm not always saying that the Israelis have all the blame to bear for that. Then you are in a situation where you are deprived of the future. Take the future away from a society and you are made a major 
killing of that society. Now, having said that, it goes without saying that Israel does not give it to Palestine a state. Maybe a mean state. And you know, unfortunately, we use the same word for a piece of real estate called the state and for the central organization administering, it's also called the state. A little bit difficult. But Israel will give them neither one nor the other on anything like acceptable terms. So let us now summarize and let us simply see the say the following. Where do we stand? We stand, I think, the following. Security, no. Sustenance, no. Idiom, yes, maybe. Religion, worldview, yes, maybe. Time, no to the past, no to the present, no to the future. Sacred space, reduced to below a minimum. And finally, a state as the carrier of autonomy and freedom where you can be a master of your own house. No. Now, there are two things that are not known in this list. And they are idiom and worldview. They are important. Maybe they have been strengthened through the process. And maybe that strengthening carries in it the seed of a Palestinian viable society. But you will understand that my conclusion is very clear. Social side. It could have been somewhat worse, but very badly wounded. The social side applies. And I repeat, I do not expect that to enter international law immediately. Because the moment it enters international law, you can imagine major parts of the world lining up immediately. And the point is, of course, that whenever you have something in law, you also have a claim. You have a claim by those who have a standing. And what the West is particularly afraid of is if those who have a standing, in addition to being declared right in their claim, want compensation. Now, that compensation would be considerable. I think almost unmentionable. So for that reason, we are up against one part of the Western plot called international law. Which doesn't mean that there isn't always in international law very many things that can be used and can be applied. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Druders, I come to the end of my statement, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> I try to discipline you. If the chairperson doesn't do it, I have to do it. <laughs> I don't know if I um, introduced the two co-chairs of uh, this session on social side. Uh, I am one of the co-chairs. I'm Cynthia McKinney. And uh, Dennis Banks, the one of the founders of the American Indian Movement is co-chairing with me. And um, if I may um, take a prerogative at the moment and just say, as Dr. Galton was um, describing the necessary ingredients for sociocide, I could only think of the African peoples who were brought over to this country and the centuries of mistreatment that we have experienced as a form of sociocide. And then, of course, I will not speak for Dennis, because I know that Dennis will speak for himself, but I could only also speak of the Native Americans as well. You want to say something, Dennis? Thank you very much for your brilliant observation of killing 
mass destruction. Um, when we look at the massacres in this country of Native people, and we look at the outright killing of whole entire tribes, uh, that of course fits the description of sociocide. But you mentioned um, socio-suicide, and I think that goes even deeper because many of our people, for no reason of all, like, like many other young people, commit suicide, and then it becomes the, the brother and the sister or the friends, there's soon 10 or 15 people within a week in Wyoming kill themselves. So it's a deep, it's a deep problem that we have now. I would like to ask the jurors if they have any questions to would ask. Would you like me to try to answer that? Oh yes, absolutely. Question because it's very important. You see, I think what happens when a country, a nation, a state commits social side starts getting obese, mm. starts getting fattened. Mm -hmm. And the fattening oh. of an imperial country. They can't hear you, so could you speak I'm a little sorry. bit? I'm sorry, I'm yes. sorry. You say I've been instructed to look at you people. <laughs> and uh, there's very strong instruction, I shall not even look at them. I should uh, <laughs> just look at you people. But I can do that with the microphone close to my mouth. <laughs> now, having said that, they may become a victim of their own success. Mm. And I think Israel is heading in that direction. Mm. I notice a couple of characteristics, a high level of autism, listening only to themselves. Mm. Why do they have an ally in the United States? Because I think the United States may be on the same course of social suicide. They have an ally in the United States that George Bush Jr. pointed out because they came into being the same way. By committing social side, and in the North American case, indeed also genocide on the locals. But not only that, they thought they had a mandate by God. And when the pilgrims came on Mayflower, the sermon that was read to them on board was that there is no Zion on the eastern end of Mediterranean. It is run by Turks, by the Seljuk Turks, by Muslims. And the reason why is that the Jews didn't keep the covenant. And the basic part about the covenant, something to do with marriage. And the Puritans, as they were, were swearing not only that we will never break the covenant, but we are the new Israelis. And that the land in front of this ship is the new Zion. Whereupon they landed, whereupon they gave their sons and daughters Jewish names, and the number of the cities, Jewish names. Now, when the Jews arrived in the US, that was say the 1880s, the Alia, they were shocked by seeing their own myths replicated on US territory. Because the idea was not only social side, but also legitimized by God. Being a chosen people with a promised land. Now if you share that much, they may have the idea if one goes, so goes the other. In other words, the alliance is not military, not economic not political, it's cultural. It has those other three implications, but the cultural one is the basic one. So having said that, in this there may also be a prediction. Maybe that both of them are swallowing more than they can digest. And that in the end they become a victim of their own, quote, success, unquote. And from that point on, it goes down. Thank you. We do have uh, a question from one juror, Ronnie Casrills, Maraid afterwards. Anyone on this side? 
Okay. Uh, I, I would like to thank you. It's not a um, pleasant message. Talking about the slow death. In a bit, Sorry. Um, I'm thanking the professor. It's not a, a palatable message, of course. Anything dealing with the slow death of a people, uh, whatever we refer to at Genocide Sociedad, uh, talking about the Palestinian people. And of course, the hour after lunch is always referred to as the graveyard hour <laughs> at meetings like this. You come after um, Noam Chomsky speaking to us at the end of the morning session, and he ended with the words on Palestine, the future is bleak. I'm not sure at all. We certainly saw in South Africa, if we talk about the whites, for instance, not the most important element there of the struggle, but the rulers, they came to a point in time where they realized that they were on the path of a social suicide of a kind. And through the struggle of people and the international pressure of civil society, they woke up in the end and sued for peace. But the question that, that I raise, because it is a very pessimistic message that we've now received from two speakers in a row, how do you f see the prospects? Do you see them as Professor Chomsky does? Or do you see possibilities, as I'm sure a lot of us do, as we saw in South Africa when things looked very dire and bleak, that there are possibilities for human beings through unity and struggle and with the support of others internationally to overcome the bleakest and direst of situations. I do not think that my friend Noam Chomsky's strong side is prospects. And yours? It's what about more yours? retrospects. And he knows that I know that I say this. So. Okay, but, but Professor, yeah. what about yours? Now, the point I'm making is I don't think that his pointer to the future is sufficient. And he also shut up immediately. But I would like to say something about South Africa that is highly relevant for the Middle East. I have happened to have discussed this very much with Mandela and the Clerk. And I think the basic point was that they agreed on a cooperate, cooperative, black-white South Africa. And in that cooperative process, of course, Mandela insisted on rule of law and persecuting for political crimes. The clerk rebutted since almost all the political crimes against human beings are done by the whites. You can forget our agreement if you insist on that. I want amnesty. And Mandela said, if you want amnesty, you can forget our agreement. So they landed on one thing, confession. And if the confession is honest, with an element of contrition, maybe an element of compensation, amnesty. It was an act of genius. And in doing so, I think they have changed jurisprudence for the future. It'll take some time before it penetrates the Western lust for punishment, which is almost insatiable with all kinds of justifications. It'll take some time. Now, what I am saying, which would be the parallel, would be for Palestinians and Jews in that mood to work out what a Middle East community could look like. And I'm not insisting on the word Middle East, but some kind of community. And it means a place where it would be in the interest for both of them to cooperate equitably, to be sensitive to each other's fears, traumas, and glorias, even to the point that you almost start internalizing it. Now, for this, negative nonviolence is not enough. You need the Gandhian positive nonviolence of trying to get the other party on your side. And you have to project the future of cooperation. I do not, as I say, believe in the one-state solution, nor in the two-state solution. I believe in the six-state solution. 
within a setting of an organization for security and cooperation in the Middle East, in West Asia, prefer the word West Asia. Middle East is something that comes from the British Foreign Ministry. And I think West Asia is geographically more correct. And it has to do with slightly myopic Britain sitting in London. Now, this is important. And along that line, I would be optimistic. But I think it takes time and it takes work. And you have to build down some of your antagonisms. I'm not quite sure that Benjamin Netanyahu is the ideal dialogue partners, <laughs> especially since his father was Stein's representative in New York for the Stein Charter. But having said that, in that direction, I think the future would be lying. Thank you very much, um, Mairead. Um, Professor Galtung, I would like to thank you very much for your contribution and for your lifetime's work in peacemaking around the world. Um, your work has inspired me greatly. Thank you, Professor. My question to you is, Professor, from our own experience in Northern Ireland, um, we, we remember when one of our leading politicians said, it is a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. Uh, once again, I agree. A, one in Northern Ireland, one of our politicians said, we will make a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. In other words, they were recognizing majoritarianism in the North as belonging only to the Unionist and ignoring the minority Catholic community. <coughs> of course, people realized that you can't have a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. No more can you have a Jewish state for a Jewish people. Whenever in Northern Ireland it was recognized that we needed to have human rights and civil liberties for all the people, not just a few, then things began to change. <coughs> in Israel and Palestine, my own feeling, having visited it often, and I'm very hopeful for Israeli and Palestine because I've met the people and I believe there will be peace. But a one-state solution, to me, doesn't, uh, doesn't answer all the questions because you need more than that for the Arabs within uh, Israel. Uh, a two-state solution, to me, seems, how are you ever going to make that work? So I like your idea of looking beyond these, um, these two, two solutions because we in Northern Ireland only solved our problem when we looked out to Europe and said, hey, we're part of Europe, we're part of the world. How and what is the process of finding this sacred space for the Palestinian people and for the Israelis to look at all the options as opposed to those of us sitting here and saying, you will have a one state, two state. Notice the absence of Palestinian voices here. How do we create that secret space where the answer comes out from the people and it's something new? Thanks indeed for extremely important questions. I'll try to answer at least some of it. At the end of the 1940s, two very famous French politicians. It was actually one of them who suggested it to the other. The other was prime minister and had never time to read the document. But the French railroads were too late one day. So we found the time to read it on the station. But this is an argument for delays in railroads <laughs> to give politicians a chance. In that document was a suggested speech. Germany has been so atrocious that it has to become a member of the family. Now that was to many a non sequitur. And people laughed and people harangued them. And the result of that speech is called the European community. The family didn't exist, it had to be created. 
So I have among my dreams two Arab presidents standing up saying, Israel has been so atrocious that it has to become a member of the family. Now what will be the cultural basis for that family? As we all know, Islam is accommodating to Judaism and Christianity. Moses is called Musa and Jesus is called Isa. And they are now the announcers as opposed to the Rasul, the Prophet Muhammad. Whereas Judaism and Christianity turns their back to Islam. Secularism is based on human rights, where the word everybody is very important. Now there could be a secularist Islamic combination where Judaism and Christianity would pick up the secularism and they would unite in the human rights that you mentioned. But one has to be aware of the fact that human rights only tell you one side of the issue. They only tell you the rights of the underdog. They don't tell you the arguments of the top dog. And my experience talking with top dogs all over the world is that they have one existential fear that if the underdog comes up, they will treat us as badly as we treated them. Now, the question is, how do you put that anxiety <coughs> to ease? And Christian Zionism is not the way to do it. James Falwell's, the late James Falwell, a major key evangelical, said that the coming battle, the battle, and the more Jews are there, the better. In the Middle East, the more will we accelerate the coming of Jesus Christ. Acceleration of Jesus Christ through the battle. Now, he doesn't quite say that the Jews will disappear except for those who convert to Christianity. So the news in the revelation for the Jews are not that good. To which the Jewish politicians say, we don't believe any of that stuff anyhow. <laughs> as long as you support us, that's okay with us. Wait. Yeah, this is the situation today. I think we have to emerge at a higher level, as I mentioned. Thank you so much. We are flat out of time, even though I had two questions of my own. We don't get a chance to hear voices like this. Thank goodness for the Russell Tribunal for bringing Dr. Galton to us. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. I only look at you.